Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we'll be exploring Final Destination 2, the 2003 supernatural horror directed by David R. Ellis. Starring Ali Lata, AJ Cook, Michael Landis, and the legendary Tony Todd, it revolves around a group of survivors that must overcome the supposedly inescapable design of death. I covered the first film a few years ago in a video I'll be leaving a link to below, but for the uninitiated, in James Wong's Final Destination, Alex Browning has a premonition that the flight he and his classmates are on is about to explode after takeoff. Shocked by these claims, a few of the passengers exit Valet Airlines Flight 180, and just as he predicted, the plane exploded right after takeoff. Oh, shit! <laughs> But this was no miracle or grace of luck. The survivors proceed to go on with their lives, grateful, but also confused about what happened. We soon learn that Alex's premonition enabled them to cheat Death's design. Because of this, Death comes for each of them in the order that they were supposed to die on the flight, using their environment to bring them down in creative ways. So who's next? The original movie set the formula for every installment that followed it. Essentially, an individual has a premonition about how they and a group are about to die. They save the others from the accident, only for death to catch up to them. But while the majority of the films in the series offer a more deterministic notion of death, essentially positing that death cannot be cheated, Final Destination 2 throws a spanner in the works, much like Terminator 2 Judgment Day, suggesting there was perhaps a way to make a fate for ourselves. I control my life, alright? Not some crazy list that death has put together. The film opens with a reporter explaining tomorrow will mark the one year anniversary of Valet Flight 180. The disaster ravaged Mount Abraham High School, claiming 40 of their students and 4 of their teachers. He also notes how the survivors that got off the plane died soon after, in a series of bizarre accidents that some believe are an indication that sinister events are taking place. His special guest has some radical notions. The man proposes there's an unseen malevolent force around us that determines when we live and die. While some call the presence the devil, he thinks it's actually the manifestation of death itself. The reporter jokingly asks if he's surrounded by death, and the man assures him that is absolutely the case, and that death has a grand design that we all fit into. So when Alex Browning got off that plane, he basically screwed up death's plan. Are you listening to yourself? I mean, this is crazy. He believes this is why death came back to claim them all. We're then introduced to our protagonist, Kimberly Corman, who's woken up by a gust of wind and opens her eyes to see the rest of the discussion on her television. Luckily, this enables her to hear him say that there was something that could be done about it. The only way to survive is to look beneath the visible world, and today may be your day to die. Despite the ominous signs, Kimberly gets ready to head to Daytona Beach for spring break the following day with her friends Shayna, Dano, and Frankie. While they wait on the entrance ramp to US Route 23, a homeless woman approaches the car and accidentally drops all of her collected cans. Instead of helping, they all laugh it off and continue driving. They turn on the radio and a news report tells us a memorial for Flight 180 will be held at the Mount Abraham Auditorium. When Kim changes the station, the usually thematically relevant Highway to Hell starts playing. Not realizing they were in a horror film, Kim changes the station again and continues driving ahead. With the use of clever vehicular choreography, we're then introduced to the rest of the principal cast, from lottery winner Evan Lewis, Nora Carpenter and her 15-year-old son Tim, businesswoman Kat Jennings, the pregnant Isabella Hudson, high school teacher Eugene Dix, addict Rory Peters, and deputy marshal Thomas Burke. Noticing transmission fluid in the driveway, Kim's father calls them to advise that they head to the nearest mechanic before continuing with the road trip, but this is the least of their worries. Not only does a kid in the car beside them have a toy replica of the vehicle they're in, but as he smiles, he continually smashes it into a large black truck, foreshadowing what was about to happen. With that, an unsecure load of timber logs from a black truck in front of them begin to fall and wreak havoc, ultimately killing all of them in a massive pileup that also takes the lives of many more unfortunate drivers. Waking up from the premonition, Kimberly sees the homeless woman again. Noticing all the same signs as before, she tells her friends they're about to die in an accident before blocking the entrance ramp with her car, preventing the people behind them from getting on the highway. While Burke tries to calm her down, thinking she was having a mental crisis, Kim tells him she witnessed an accident that killed all of them. Just as Kim said, the pileup occurs, but while the others from the premonition survive, and Burke manages to save Kimberly from another semi-trailer at the last second, her friend Shayna, Dano and Frankie are demolished by the impact. With police busy dealing with those that were killed and injured in the pileup, nobody at the station seems to be concerned about the survivors other than Burke, who witnessed the whole thing. In fact, his superior tells him they should all consider themselves lucky. In fact, all of them are scared, as you can imagine. Scared? 
These people are the luckiest sons of bitches on the planet. Regardless, seeding everyone together so they could better understand what happened, Burke tells Kim to explain what she experienced. Kimberly tells them that she knew something was going to happen because she saw it moments before the pileup. She then goes on to say that her premonition was precisely like the curse of Flight 180, which happened exactly a year ago to the day. When Nora asks what she's talking about, Eugene explains how, despite Alex's premonition initially saving the group, it wasn't long before the rest of the survivors perished under mysterious circumstances, jokingly alluding to the notion that Kim was implying that they were also about to die. Burke then interrupts, pointing out that there was one survivor that nobody talked about. Turns out, after her friends had died, Clear Rivers isolated herself to a padded room at the Stony Brook Institution. But not realizing the gravity of their predicament, the group leave and go their separate ways. Just as Kim feared, death comes for Evan Lewis. Despite avoiding a few near accidents, including slipping over while carrying multiple gifts for himself, Evan paves the way for his eventual demise by throwing old pastor out the window. After listening to his phone messages filled with 304s that found out he now had money, Evan pours a heap of oil onto a dirty frying pan and pulls out food he's planning on heating. Foreshadowing the means of his death, when he closes the freezer door, one of the magnetic letters falls into a container of Chinese food, revealing the word I. As he puts the container in the microwave and ignores the oil heating on the frying pan, he dons his new gold watch and admires his new earrings. Unfortunately, the magnetic letter creates explosive fires in the microwave that cause him to accidentally drop his earring down the drain. Evan then stupidly puts his watch hand down the drain to retrieve it and gets stuck as fires begin to rage in the kitchen. While he manages to free himself and climb down the emergency ladder before his apartment explodes, he ultimately slips on the spaghetti he threw down earlier and is impaled through the eye by the ladder. Meanwhile, Burke is going through police records of Alex Browning and the Flight 180 survivors that eventually perished, noting their freak deaths were so weird that there had to be something to Kimberly's theory. At the same time, each of the people that survived today's freak disaster are watching a news report about the pileup and are shocked to learn about Evan's bizarre death. Wanting to find some answers, Kim decides to visit Clear at Stony Brook Institution. One of the doctors tells Kim that not only did Clear voluntarily admit herself into the padded cell, but that she'd come up with a plan to reduce her chances of dying. This included forcing visitors to remove all sharp objects or items that could potentially cause death. Everything from necklaces, pens, bobby pins, matches, lighters, belts, glasses, shoelaces, food, drinks, keys, cell phones to medication. Startled by this request, Kim asks if she was dangerous and is told that it's actually Clear who expects her to be a threat. Nonetheless, she enters the room and tells her about the premonition she had before the pileup. Unfortunately, Clear explains that Kim, along with the people she saved, were now on death's list. She continues by saying the survivors of Flight 180 ended up dying in the exact order they were meant to die in the plane crash. When Kimberly informs the troubled woman that Evan was the first of the highway survivors to die, unlike in her premonition, Clear realizes the survivors were now dying in reverse order. She goes on to advise her to watch out for creepy ominous signs and not ignore them, as their recognition could mean the difference between life and death. But when Kim demands she join her to figure out a way to destroy the design that death had laid for them all, Clear tells her she doesn't have to do anything before ordering her to leave. I think you're a coward. My opinion, you're already dead. Kim then returns home to find Burke waiting for her. Troubled by his research and overwhelmed by calls from the other survivors, the trooper is organized for all of them to meet up at his apartment. Burke also informs her that he started to believe in all this death stuff when Kim freaks out to the sight of pigeons attacking them in the reflection of the glass windows behind them. Did you see that? It's a sign. Reasoning this must be a sign and knowing that Nora and Tim were next in the list, Kim tells him that they're about to die soon if they don't find them. And she's absolutely right. While death seemingly fails to kill them at the dentist through a series of bizarre events involving flooding the floors to electrocute Nora and nearly suffocating Tim to death, Tim is ultimately squashed by a massive sheet of glass that falls on top of him while he was distracted by pigeons. Although broken by this tragedy, they are pleased to find Clear at Kim's home. Deciding that remaining in a padded cell was no life at all, she's decided to help them despite knowing that this will put her on death's radar again. The second one just died. 15 year old kid. I hope you're ready for this. First stop is the disconcerting undertaker, William Bloodworth, who happens to be cremating Evan. William initially tells them that they cannot escape death's plan, before conceding the introduction of life that was not meant to be could force death to start anew. Only new life can defeat death. Kimberly also has another premonition of someone crashing into a lake and drowning. Believing the birth of Isabella's baby would disrupt death's plan, Burke tells Marshal Steve Adams to take her into custody and gathers the others in his apartment. 
The meeting starts off well, with Kim giving each of them a phone and telling them to look out for signs. Skeptical about the whole thing, Eugene tells them that he can't believe that he doesn't have control of his fate, but as he storms off, a cascading series of bizarre events nearly takes Clear out. And so, they all carefully begin to death-proof the home. Accepting that her time has come, the grieving Nora leaves and is followed by Eugene, who still refuse to believe their stories about cheating death. After nearly getting KO'd by items in the closet, Rory then sees a shadow of a man with hooks as Nora and Eugene enter the elevator. Of course, behind them is a creepy guy with a box of hooks. The group immediately call Nora's phone to warn her that a man with hooks was going to kill her. Just as death had designed, Nora gets the back of her hair caught in one of the hooks and begins to freak out, leading to her head then getting caught in the malfunctioning doors which proceed to decapitate her. By this point, everybody including Eugene is on board with a plan to save Isabella and enable her to give birth, thereby hopefully disrupting Death's plan. <laughs> Learning Isabella was in protective custody at a nearby jail, they all make their way to her, but when her water breaks, the deputy is forced to take her to hospital using the van. As the group race to Isabella, each of them mentions how they all had narrowly avoided Death prior to the pileup. You guys remember that theater in Paris that collapsed last year and killed everybody inside? Buy tickets to go. It's at this point that Clear realizes Death is trying to seal the rift. They all essentially would have been dead already if it wasn't for the late deaths of the Flight 180 survivors. And so, as Death would have it, their tire pops, causing Cat to crash, narrowly avoiding Officer Adams and Isabella in the van. Unfortunately, the car is impaled by a small log, trapping Cat inside. Eugene also suffers a punctured lung and is rushed to the hospital. Importantly, it's at this point that Rory saves a young landscaper named Brian Gibbons from being hit by a speeding news van. Once again, just as death had planned, the tank on the news van is ruptured, causing fuel to run down a pipe towards the car that Cat was trapped inside. At the same time, firemen working to get her out deploy the airbags, accidentally killing her. The cigarette she was holding then falls and blows into the pipe, igniting the petrol and causing the news van to explode. Taking another life, the explosion sends a barbed fence towards Rory, cutting him in three. As the three of them that were left race to the hospital, death begins to torment Eugene, and Kim has another vision about being suffocated to death by Dr. Kalergian. Burke and Kim find the delivery room to see Isabella's baby is born without complications. Unfortunately for them, Kim gets one more vision of the pregnant woman watching the pileup take place from a safe distance, and determines that Isabella was never part of this design. As if things couldn't get any worse, while Clear ends up finding Eugene, a series of events result in a massive explosion that claims them both. Recognizing her scars from the vision, Kimberly realizes that she is the new life. The doctor was not a threat, but someone tried to save Kim after she deliberately drowned herself to force death to start anew. And so, Kim jumps in a van and drives right into the lake. While she drowns, she's ultimately resuscitated by Dr. Kalergian, thus enabling them to cheat death. Of course, there is more to the story. When they're invited to the Gibbons family home for a barbecue the following year and talk about how life is finally going back to normal, Mr. Gibbons tells them how Brian was saved by Rory. With that, Kimberly and Burke look at each other, moments before the barbecue grill explodes with Brian in front of it. While Kimberly and Burke are the only ones that have managed to outsmart Death in the entire series, Death was still very much around them, fulfilling its purpose. Well, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Final Destination 2. If there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.